A great Yale historian wrote these amazing words. Regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. If it were possible, with some sort of super magnet, to pull up out of that history every scrap of metal bearing at least a trace of his name, how much would be left? And now we study the life of the man who changed the world, because he is changing lives still. On the day after Jesus died, it looked like whatever little mark that he had made on the world would rapidly disappear. Instead, his impact on human history has been without parallel. Now, normally when somebody dies, their impact on the world immediately begins to recede. As I'm speaking, our world is still talking about the passing of Steve Jobs. Somebody wrote that 10 years ago, our world had Bob Hope, Johnny Cash, and Steve Jobs. Now, we have no jobs, no cash, and no hope. But Jesus inverted this normal human trajectory, as he did so many others. His impact was greater 100 years after his death than during his life. It was greater still after 500 years. After 1,000 years, his legacy laid the foundation for much of Europe. After 2,000 years, he has more followers in more places than ever. And yet, his vision of life continues to haunt and challenge humanity. His influence has swept over history like the tail of a comet, bringing his inspiration to what has happened in art, science, government, medicine, and education. He has taught people about dignity, compassion, forgiveness, and hope. His presence is unavoidable. He is history's most familiar figure. His impact on the world is immense and non-accidental. Great men have sometimes tried to secure immortality by having cities named after themselves. The ancient world was littered with cities that Alexander named Alexandria and Caesar named Caesarea. While Jesus was alive, he had no place to live. And yet today, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, which has its name because a man named Francis was once a follower of this man Jesus. Our state capital is called Sacramento because Jesus once had a meal with his followers, the Last Supper, that became known as a sacrament. You cannot look at a map without being reminded of this man. Powerful regimes have often tried to establish their importance by dating the calendar around their existence. Roman emperors would date events according to the years of their reign. They marked past history by the founding of Rome itself. The French Revolution tried to enlighten everybody with a calendar that marked the reign of reason. Soviet Union dated time from the deposing of the Tsar and when power was given to the people. Now, the idea of Jesus trying to impose a calendar on anybody was laughable. His birth itself was carefully noted by Luke according to the Roman calendar. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree while Quirinius was governor of Syria and so on. From complete obscurity, Jesus came to public attention for the blink of an eye, maybe three years, maybe less. And yet today, every time I look at a calendar, every time I date a check, I am reminded that chronologically at least, this incredibly brief life has become somehow the dividing line of human history. Famous people sometimes try to preserve their legacy by having other folks named for them. The Bible is full of characters named Herod or even Herodias, who were supposed to remind us of Herod the Great. On the day after Jesus died, nobody in the tiny circle that knew his identity was naming their new baby after him. But today, the names of Caesar and Nero are used, if at all, for pizza parlors or dogs or casinos, while the names in Jesus' book live on and on. He has been portrayed in movies 
by too many actors to name, from a guy named Frank Russell way back in 1898, to H.B. Warner, Jeffrey Hunter, Max von Sydow, Donald Sutherland, John Hurt, Willem Dafoe, Christian Bale, as well as countless others. Songs about him have been sung by too many to count. From the first known song, listed by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Philippi, to a Christmas album about to be released, wait for it, by Justin Bieber. Even in the field of mental health, if patients have grandiose identity disorders, it is Jesus they imagine themselves to be. Like, do grandiose Buddhists imagine themselves to be the Buddha? It is in Jesus' name that desperate people pray, grateful people worship, and angry people swear. From christenings, to weddings, to sick rooms, to funerals, it is in Jesus' name that people are hatched, matched, patched, and dispatched. From the dark ages to post-modernity, He is the man who won't go away. And His influence is inescapable. Children would be thought of differently because of Jesus. There's a historian, O.M. Bakke, who has written a fascinating study. It's called, When Children Became People, the birth of childhood in early Christianity. Bakke notes that in the ancient world, children generally didn't even get named until the eighth day or so. Up until then, there was time for an infant to be killed or left to die of exposure, particularly if that child was deformed or the wrong gender, and you can guess what gender that was. This changed historically because of a group of people who remembered they followed a man who said, let the little children come to me who said, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus never married. But the way that he treated women led to the formation of a community that was so congenial to women that women would join it in record numbers. As a matter of fact, the church was sometimes disparaged by its opponents in the ancient world for precisely that reason. Jesus' teachings about sexuality would lead to the dissolution of a sexual double standard that was actually encoded, kind of proudly enshrined in Roman law. Jesus never wrote a book, but his call to love God with all your mind would lead to a community that had such a reverence for learning that when the classical world was destroyed in what are sometimes called the Dark Ages, that little community of Jesus' followers would preserve what was left of classical learning. In time, the movement that Jesus started is what gave rise to libraries and then guilds of learning. Eventually, Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and Yale and virtually the entire Western system of education and scholarship would arise because of his followers. The insistence on universal literacy grew out of an understanding that this Jesus, who himself was a teacher who highly praised truth, told his followers that they ought to enable every person in the world to be able to learn from themselves. Jesus never held an office, never led an army. He said that his kingdom was not of this world. He was on the wrong side of the law at the beginning of his life and at the end of his life. And yet, the movement that he started would eventually mean the end of emperor worship. It would be cited in documents like the Magna Carta. It would begin a tradition of common law and limited government. It would undermine the power of the state rather than reinforce it as other religions in the empire had done. It is because of his movement that language like, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, entered history. The Roman Empire, into which Jesus was born, could be splendid, but it could also be cruel, especially for the malformed and the diseased and the enslaved. But this teacher, Jesus, had said, whatever you do for the least of these, for those who are sick, for the poor, for the imprisoned, you do for me. 
and an idea slowly emerged and took root in a larger culture that the suffering of every single individual human being, whether or not they're in my tribe, matters, and that those who are able to help ought to help. And so hospitals and relief efforts of all kinds emerged from this movement. Even today, they often carry names like the Red Cross or the Salvation Army that remind us of Jesus and His teachings. Humility, which was scorned in the ancient world, became enshrined in a cross and eventually championed as a virtue. Enemies, who were thought to be worthy of vengeance, the ancients said, help your friends and punish your enemies, came to be seen as worthy of love. Forgiveness moved from being seen as a weakness to being seen as an act of moral beauty. Jesus is also the man who would not give up. His appeal is inexhaustible. Jesus is deeply mysterious, not only because he lived a long time ago in a world strange to us. Jesus is not just mysterious because of what we don't know about him. He is mysterious because of what we do know about him. When he began to teach, people were sometimes delighted, sometimes infuriated, but always amazed. Pilate couldn't understand him. Herod plied him with questions. His own disciples were often as confused as anybody. People who listened to him at that time said things like, we've never heard anybody talking like this. And they didn't mean just his tone of voice or his skillful speaking. Jesus puzzled people in, and he puzzles us still. But it's not a random, absurd, meaningless puzzle. Understanding his life is like trying to wake up from a dream. It's like listening to an answer which, when you get it, you realize you always somehow knew. It's like light on a strange path that, when you follow it, turns out to lead you home. Jesus, the liberator, keeps breaking through. When people claim his authority for something wrong, like for slavery, a William Wilberforce or a Jonathan Blanchard sees in Jesus the call to freedom. Jesus inspired Tolstoy who in turn inspired Gandhi, who loved the Sermon on the Mount, who in turn inspired Martin Luther King. Jesus would inspire Desmond Tutu to dream up and pray up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The number of groups claiming to be for Jesus are inexhaustible. To name just a few, Jews for Jesus, Muslims for Jesus, ex-Masons for Jesus, road riders for Jesus, cowboys for Jesus, wrestlers for Jesus, clowns for Jesus, puppets for Jesus, even atheists for Jesus. And then look at the diversity of people that Jesus alone could bring together. Jesse Jackson and Jerry Falwell, Jim Wallace and Jim Dobson, Anne Lamott and Thomas Kincaid, Billy Graham, Billy Sunday, Bill Clinton and Bill Shakespeare. Bono and Bach and Bev Shea, Galileo and Newton and Kepler, Aquinas, Akempis, T.S. Eliot, C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, George Washington, Denzel Washington, George Washington Carver, Sojourner Truth and Robert E. Lee, Constantine and Charlemagne and Sarah Palin and Barack Obama. Milton and Bunyan and Mr. Rogers and Jimmy Carter and Peter the Great. He is the man that nobody really knows, but not just that. His endurance is inextinguishable. The first person to write about him, who would become known as Paul, said that Jesus appeared to him unbidden and unwanted. And he has a strange way, this Jesus, of continuing to show up where he is not always sought or even welcome. Ralph Waldo Emerson said once that the name of Jesus was not so much written as plowed into the history of this world. The writer H.G. Wells marveled that after two millennia, a historian like myself who does not even call himself a Christian, 
finds the picture centering irresistibly around the life and character of this most significant man. Well said, the historian's test of an individual's greatness is, what did he leave to grow? Did he start men to thinking along fresh lines with a vigor that persisted after him? By this test, Jesus stands first. Jesus stands alone. Why? You've got to ask yourself, no matter what you think of Jesus, why did he have this impact? Maybe it's timing. Maybe Jesus was just a sympathetic figure who happened to come along when Roman infrastructure was good and Greek philosophy was undermining the gods, when paganism was dying and social systems were collapsing, when stability was down and anxiety was up and gullibility was strong and it was just dumb luck. Maybe Jesus was a kind, simple, innocent soul with a good mom and a knack for catchy sayings who showed up in the right place at the right time. Jesus Gump. Maybe his place in history is a remarkable accident. But maybe it isn't. Maybe he has touched the world in the way that he has because he is who he said that he was. His life, his impact is worth thinking, is worth reflecting on, whatever you believe about him right now. But I'd like to give you one more thing to think about as we enter into this study together. We will look at the remarkable, unprecedented, unrivaled ways in which he has impacted our world, our history. But the personal question is, how has he impacted your life? Or maybe, how would you like for him to impact your life? As we begin our study, you might want to think about this. What's one of his teachings? Like maybe about loving enemies and difficult people. Or maybe turning the other cheek when somebody is angry at you. Or maybe being concerned for the poor that you would like to have shape your own life. How would you like the life of this man, Jesus, to make your own life different?